Ladies and gentlemen, can we take seats? We're ready to begin the final session. Okay, our final session for the day is a different focus. It's a focus on largely the Middle East, the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, it is, I guess by general reputation, the most intractable of all the major conflicts in the world in, in this generation. It's certainly, in addition to having generated uh, a great deal of anguish in the region has generated a great deal of commentary and scholarship. Um, so we're going to get, take a chance today on seeing if we can say something different uh, that people have not seen and heard before. We've got four presenters with a great deal of interesting and relevant and quite different experience regarding the topic. Uh, Nava Sonnenschein uh, is uh, a member, a resident of Neve Shalom Wahata Salam, uh, which means Oasis of Peace, a village in Israel, uh, halfway, for those who know, halfway between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Um, she is a founder of the village in the late 70s. She and her husband moved there. They were the second or third family to move there at the time. She is a founder of the School for Peace, which we'll hear more about from her. Uh, which is a training center that has trained about 60,000 Arabs and Jews in the area. Um, and she is now working on the latest development within the village, the development of a peace college, which UMass Boston and the village are doing jointly. Um, second up will be Chris Taylor, who is the director at Drew University Center on Religion, Culture, and Conflict. Uh, and his major focus is a model which he's going to describe to us um, and working on right now on developing the larger lessons uh, which will be the subject of future publications, trying to st see how that model works, what can be made of that model, and its relevance, of course, for the kinds of things we're talking about today. Uh, our third speaker uh, will be Charlie Sennett. Uh, Charlie is a journalist who has covered uh, I asked him what places he had covered. By the time he was done talking, I asked him what places of conflict he had not covered. It would make a lot easier. He's been on every battle zone that we've all been reading about. He was a, a reporter for many years with the Boston Globe, now has, is the head of an outfit called the Global Post, which is an online journalism enterprise. And he is the author of The Body and the Blood, The Holy Land's Christians, and The Possibility of Peace, which will be the topic uh, of his talk. And our uh, final speaker will be Par Gamali, uh, the Mokley chair holder here at uh, UMass Boston, uh, an author, an expert on the Irish conflict, on the South African conflict, and is now finishing a book uh, on the Arab-Israeli conflict. So he is a person who has done the most profound comparative work uh, on different conflicts of major and protracted sort, uh, and he will talk to us about the peace process uh, and um, what its likelihood is. So we will start now with Nava talking about Neve Shalom. Nava? Good afternoon. Uh, <coughs> Before I start, uh, I just uh, want to put things in context. Uh, I think uh, religion is connected to the conflicts that we are dealing uh, with uh, in, in two major aspects. One, that uh, there is no separation between the state and religion. The state based the citizenship on religion and became a state of a people that is defined in religion terms. And this situation is uh, causing a massive ex exclusion of Arabs who are 20% of uh, Israeli 
uh, citizens, uh, which is a major problem. Another problem is related to the military occupation. Uh, Israeli government supported Gush Emunim uh, settlements on Palestinian land, and Gush Emunim was and is a social religious national movement to settle the occupied, occupied territories. It started from religious sentiment to the land, but later it became the official policy of the governments uh, uh, over the years and until today. Uh, the School for Peace was the major, the main outreach of the joint community Neve Shalom Wachat El Salam. Uh, how, how do I operate? I just, oh, I okay, it's now it's, it's uh, okay, now it's on. Uh, <clears throat> the main outreach, we said to ourselves, yes, we are unique community where Jews and Palestinians, the only one where Jews and Palestinians decided to live together in uh, equality, in uh, sharing power positions between them, but we want to have an impact on the rest of the population in Israel and later also between Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, over the years, as David mentioned, uh, about 65,000 participants uh, participated in our programs. Uh, they mainly came to workshops and courses uh, of conflict resolution uh, based on uh, group work uh, in intensive dialogue. Uh, and over the years, we developed a unique model of working with groups in conflict. Uh, and it was a groundbreaking model that went against main uh, convention in group works that we were used to. Uh, the focus was on the two identities, on the conflict, on the intergroup conflict, and not so much on the interpersonal uh, relations. Uh, this approach uh, contradicted the whole concept of group, group work that we were used to that said that a person is speaking in his or her name and not in the name of the group. In each person, uh, that each person is a private person and responsible for himself or herself. Uh, what we, di what we did, we said uh, interpersonally there is not a big difference between us or a problem. The problem is between the two groups, the two national groups that are sharing this piece of land. So that should be the focus of intervention. Uh, until today, most of those working with the, with the Jewish-Palestinian conflict and uh, do uh, uh, encounters or are still based on human relation or contact hypothesis. But we understood from research and our experience that the main problem uh, in working from contact hypothesis is uh, that people don't have the ability to generalize from their own experience to the macro level. And they would say, the people I, ha I have met are, the Arabs I have met are wonderful, but they don't represent the whole. Um, uh, in the way we work, when we look at the two groups and the focus is on the intergroup level is uh, uh, was helping people to start to take responsibility for what is going on. We all, the second groundbreaking uh, rule, uh, rule was uh, to, to put the conflict on the, on the table. We, we said uh, uh, Usually at that time it was uh, said, 
we should let the group go gradually until they reach the point of the conflict. Uh, first, they create relation, interpersonal relations, and then they can get into it. In the method we developed, we tell the people that they are coming to talk about the conflict. This is the center of, of uh, what is going on. Uh, the third pi pioneering aspect of our work is that we, we focus our work to look on the asymmetry in power relations. Uh, we believe that the issue of power relation is central to our conflict, either between the occupier and the occupied, or inside Israel between the majority that are Jews and the minorities that are Palestinian citizens of Israel. And we really focus, uh, people get eyeglasses to look on different dynamics in different setting, even if it, it is gender or between Jews and Palestinians or Ashkenazi Jews or Sephardic Jews to look on what is going on uh, in the room. And in many cases, although there will be even number of people from both sides, people bring this dynamic into, into the group process. Um, the, the fourth uh, pioneering aspect was to look at the, at the group as a microcosm of society. That we believe that uh, although there are single individuals that are coming, uh, uh, we believe that all the, all the elements that existing in the larger society may be found in some forum within each of us. Uh, for example, regardless of the actual number of Arabs and Jewish participants in the meeting, even if there are more Arabs than Jews, the phenomena of majority and minority groups are manifest, uh, manifested uh, intact. Uh, I want to share with, uh, um, we do it by the structure of the encounter. We uh, usually, today it's, it's quite common because we have an influence on what is going on, but at that time it was unique. Uh, uh, we work with equal number of participants, with two facilitators, a Jew and a Palestinian, uh, in two forums. Uh, most of the process is done binationally, where the Jews and Palestinians are in the room, and uh, uh, once every three, four sessions, we do uninational forum in uh, which the Palestinian groups uh, sit with the Palestinian facilitator and the Jewish group sit with the Jewish facilitator and they re reflect upon issues that come to them in the encounter because the encounter is very intensive emotionally and in other aspects. And they need the space to analyze and understand the processes that come and happen to them. Uh, both languages are official languages of the encounter. You can imagine that people come to, to a dialogue, uh, one of the first issues that they will discuss, what language should they speak? The Jews, are, uh, the Palestinians within Israel are bilingual. Uh, as a minority, they have to know the other language, but the Jews as a majority usually don't know Arabic. Uh, we believe that language is not only a tool for communication, but it's a part of identity. It's a very important part of culture. So people can speak their own language and the fa facilitators also encourage the uh, legitimacy of using Arabic uh, by also talking to the group in Arabic and then translating. And uh, on a nutshell, the issue of uh, 
the issue of uh, uh, language is one example of the issue of uh, power relations. Um, we have several assumptions behind our interventions that uh, uh, stereotypes are just a surface of much deeper perceptions that each group has on the other. Uh, for, uh, superiority, inferiority, racism are deep-rooted and very difficult to change. In order to deal with, with those deep perceptions, we have to let the group uh, speak about the conflict and uh, eventually those deep perceptions and behaviors will come to the surface and then we can help the group to start to analyze what is going on. Um, one of the issues that uh, is coming very much into the uh, encounters is uh, that is relevant to the subject of the conference is a struggle over who is more humane. Uh, uh, we think that uh, we saw in many of our groups this uh, dynamic that uh, each side uh, is a uh, in, is in, in this uh, search of, uh, to, to prove that uh, their side is more human than the other. Uh, um, and it's a power struggle. We see, we see it in, uh, 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 in a research that we have done, uh, which was conducted in one of the groups uh, uh, in, uh, after October 2000, when the second intifada started, uh, we examined what happened regarding this issue in, in the groups, and we found that uh, the inhumane images of the Palestinians came uh, in three situations. Uh, usually when the Palestinian group is starting to talk about the reality, the Jewish group feel that their liberal, democratic uh, value are shaken and they feel distress. One of the way to deal with this dissonance is to put on the extremist uh, image of the other. Uh, the second situation in which uh, it is coming is uh, when the Palestinian group uh, called for a civil state. Again, those inhumane images are coming to the surface. Uh, in order to justify not to change the status quo inside the country. And the third one is when the Jewish group uh, try uh, in the issue of power between the two sides to regain back the power. Uh, we don't have the time, for example, but uh, uh, is, again, to bring in the inhumane images of the other. There is a change in the process, and the change mainly is coming uh, in this regard uh, when uh, the, the Jewish participants uh, start to, to own their own power and uh, uh, to take responsibility, and uh, uh, many of those uh, and start to see uh, how uh, those, uh, uh, I will give you one example, and with that I will finish. Uh, in the interviews that were done after the intervention, uh, 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 
the interview, this is one example of, but it repeated in many of the interviews. Uh, uh, one of the partic Jewish participants said, as if it were natural to say that we accord more value to human life and these are things I grew up with, that they have this exalted goal and martyrs and we are willing to send back masses of prisoners for just one captive of ours. As if the value of human life for us is very, very strong. But on the other hand, we also have this to die for our country. Before, I was less aware of their pain, the mother pain for their children. Today, I don't know, it's hard for me to see it, uh, to see that uh, that way. So it's the, the whole concept of the other is uh, more connected to the context in which we live and not connected to the uh, sources of culture of the other. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Chris, you want to sit or you want to stand? Good afternoon, and I'd uh, also like to um, extend thanks to uh, Ben Slomoff and uh, uh, extend my felicitations on the next century. I hope the next century is going to be as good as the last one was. Um, my own Ben Slomoff is, uh, uh, is a mere 98, uh, but his wife is 100, Jane and Bernard Wallerstein, um, who've been very supportive of the work that uh, the center that I direct at Drew University. So. Um, I can only say they don't make them like this anymore, so <laughs> thank you. Um, do I have to do something to make this start or not? I think the gentleman in the back, in the back is it's gonna come up. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm gonna uh, mostly uh, show you in pictures uh, what the project that I'm involved with uh, does. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have some pictures here in a moment. Uh, it's a, a project that uh, we executed last, uh, Last summer, you need the drive again, or is it not? Oh, I have to open up. Sorry. He's coming. He's coming. There we go. Um, this was a project uh, that was the goal uh, was to encourage and equip uh, emerging religious leaders in uh, the latest um, uh, the latest uh, techniques uh, and theories of uh, conflict transformation uh, to try to reach the generation sort of uh, sort of just emerging uh, and even to try, try to turn some people who might not. Uh, uh, yet know that they're going to be transformers, but uh, to turn them, to find people like Mohammed Ashafa and James Wuye before, in a sense, and try to encourage them and move them in, in that direction. Another goal of this project was uh, to link the world of the academy with the world of praxis, uh, and uh, also then to try to develop um, the foundations uh, sort of launched the foundations of a kind of a global network of partners uh, who would encourage and develop uh, these kinds of connections. Because as many of you know, it can be very, very uh, isolating to be um, somebody who works on religious, uh, the transformation of religious conflict in a local setting. Uh, and so s to develop both national networks of people and uh, global networks. This project was uh, funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and we're very, very grateful for uh, their assistance. Uh, our vision is a, is a three-year sort of uh, test pilot of this project. We had the last one last year. We're still in the process of raising funds for future projects, but uh, we brought uh, together 30, uh, well, 24. The goal was 30 originally, but we ran into some uh, problems with our friends at Homeland Security in getting visas for uh, some of our participants, uh, particularly the Muslim ones. Uh, but we were able to get 24 out of the 30 uh, into the country. 
uh, for a one-month institute at Drew University. So they came to the university. Drew is located 25 miles west of New York City, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. It's a small liberal arts college with a Methodist seminary attached to it as well. Um, very early on in the process, um, Mohammed Ashafa uh, had a conversation with me and James Wee too, uh, and um, Imam Ashafa asked me, is this project uh, uh, pr um, thought of or conceived as um, an effort by sort of uh, folks in the United States to preach to these young emerging leaders about religious theory, or is it uh, a project to try to bring together a series of partners around the world to develop this institute together. And I told him it was the latter. And uh, so, uh, and it was, and uh, it, that was one of the great um, benefits, I think, of this, uh, of this process was, was identifying and working closely with a series of partners. Uh, so these uh, 30 um, uh, participants uh, came from Indonesia, Pakistan, Israel, Egypt, and Nigeria. And so we had partners in each of these countries that were working with us to design the program, to identify the participants, and to recruit them. Uh, in Indonesia, we worked with uh, the Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies. In Pakistan, we worked closely with Azhar Hussein and the uh, Peace Education Foundation. Many of you know Azi, I think. Uh, in Israel, we worked with Mosaica and Rabbi Michael Melchior. Uh, in Egypt, we work with Arkan and the Episcopal Church of Egypt uh, and its leader, um, uh, Bishop uh, Munir Anis. Uh, and of course, in Nigeria, we worked with uh, the Interfaith Mediation Center in Kaduna. Uh, so we worked with these partners to develop the program, uh, identify and recruit the participants, uh, and uh, so I'm just going to flip through some slides here to show you uh, the whole group. We were, uh, during this month-long uh, process, the idea was for these people to live together, study together, um, interact with some leading theorists uh, and practitioners as well of conflict transformation, to also meet with uh, some senior leaders uh, in, uh, in the three religious traditions that we focused on in this, in this program, which were Islam, Judaism and Christianity. Uh, here in this picture, you'll see um, both uh, Dr. Ali Guma, the former uh, Grand Mufti of Egypt, and Dr. Uh, Munir Anis, the bishop, Episcopal Bishop of Egypt. So we had um, people like Peter Oakes of the University of Virginia introducing uh, scriptural reasoning and working with our participants uh, to um, learn how to apply that and work with it and uh, respond to it. Those of you, some of you may know Joe Bach at Notre Dame who worked on uh, showing them uh, how to use technology uh, in dealing with both uh, as an early warning system but also uh, as a, uh, a tool. We all know that technology can be used to promote conflict. Uh, James has shown me how text messages are used to inflame conflict in Nigeria, but uh, Joe was working. Uh, to show them how you can use technology uh, in a more positive way as well. Um, Joe, by the way, those of you who know him, is currently a candidate for Congress uh, in, I believe, the second congressional district of Indiana, uh, and we're hopeful that he will unseat a Tea Party uh, candidate there. Um, this gentleman is known to most of you, I think. Mark Gopin at George Mason spoke about citizen peacemakers. Peter Coleman of Columbia focused on intractable conflicts, which is the area of his work. Arjuna Parakrama uh, spoke about uh, collective trauma. Uh, those of you familiar with Sri Lanka may know his work there. Um, so we had, we had uh, theorists, practitioners, uh, and also, as I said, senior religious leaders. Dr. Ali Goma was with us. Um, Bishop Munir was with us uh, as well. Uh, Rabbi Michael Melchior uh, joined us uh, and uh, was, uh, we worked very closely with Mosaica. Uh, Gita Hazani was, was cr cr critically important to um, this effort. We had two outstanding Israeli facilitators with us. Uh, some of you may know them. Uh, Michal Levin uh, and Shahira Shalabi were uh, helping us. Uh, of course, Imam Muhammad Ashafa was with us, as was Pastor Wuye. We got them both 
there together, which was, is very difficult to do, I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> we also had Dr. Abdul Mati, the Secretary General of the, of the Central Leadership of Muhammadiyah, which is a uh, 30 million member uh, religiously inspired social service organization, organization in Indonesia. Uh, we also had Azi Hussein, um, Peace and Education, Peace Education Foundation in Pakistan. Uh, ran a workshop for us. We also, uh, part of what we did was familiarize um, these participants with uh, each other's religious tradition. And part of that was getting them into the religious space, uh, which for many of them was a totally alien uh, idea. We did not go, by the way, for the, for the uh, choir. We went for people who were very skeptical about this uh, possibility. Uh, the El Al flight and the Egypt Air flight arrived about five minutes apart. And of course, participants knew they were going to be meeting people from the other side, uh, but they had no idea they were going to be meeting at the airport. So there was sort of great sort of uh, excitement and uh, tension uh, as the Egypt Air flight arrived a few minutes early, and then the El and they said, "You mean they're going to be right here, and we're going to ride it with them on the bus?" And I said, "Absolutely." So. Um, uh, Part of this, as I said, was getting them into the religious space, learning about each other's tradition from each other, but also from uh, uh, from uh, from others. Uh, these are uh, some of the participants looking at a scroll, Torah scroll, and uh, uh, and Sherith Israel in uh, in Manhattan, beautiful synagogue. We went, of course, to the Islamic Center in New York and met with the Imam um, there. Um, this is the Cathedral of Saint John the Divine. Uh, and for many uh, of our participants, this was the first time they had ever been in the religious space of the other, uh, and that was a special treat. We, of course, went to Ground Zero while we were in New York. Uh, we also went to the U.S. Holocaust Museum. We were talking about collective trauma and the impact of collective trauma. I had a very um, a wonderful uh, tour uh, and program there. There was, of course, lots and lots of time for um, interaction, discussion, heated debate, uh, uh, with uh, both the practitioners as well as the theorists. Um, Rabbi Melk here making a particular point <laughs> emphatically. Uh, again, many people who wondered if they could ever, you know, actually interact with the other found that they could, um, and it was a really uh, a positive for, for many of them. We, and when we were in Washington, of course, we visited uh, USIP. Uh, and uh, I want to acknowledge um, David Smock and uh, uh, Kamaral Huda, who were very helpful also to us in sort of brainstorming about how to structure uh, this uh, uh, organization. Susan Hayward, many of you may know her, uh, met with us uh, and uh, did a great job talking uh, with our uh, participants um, at the uh, Religion and Peace Building Center there. Uh, and there was just lots of opportunity for people to um, get to know each other and make good friends. Uh, and I think that picture is probably a good one to, uh, to end on. So I will um, sign off at this point and uh, I'll sit down. No, <laughs> just no, a second sorry. if you would hold on for one okay. second. One question. Sure. And that is um, any sense of evaluation of impact, either impressionistic on your part or more systematic? Um, sure. We did a lot of assessment was a big part of what we were trying to do. We had, uh, we had all the participants fill out an extensive um, survey before uh, and after at each um, workshop. Uh, they also filled out um, uh, evaluation forms and so forth. We've been pouring through those uh, and uh, uh, trying to get a sense of what we did right. Again, this is the first time we tried something like this, so getting a sense of what worked right, what didn't work right. Um, how we could do it. Overall, I think it was um, extremely successful, uh, successful uh, project. Um, there, it, it's also an extremely expensive project, and try to, you know, trying to uh, uh, fund something like this on an ongoing basis is is one of the biggest questions I've got. How do you do this? Everybody in the project got a a, 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 a cellular capable. What I don't know what you call them, but the you know the kind of iPad that can connect to the cell system uh, wherever you are and. Uh, uh, and the purpose of that was to make sure that these participants could stay in contact with each other, and that's been the, one of the biggest successes. They have stayed in contact with each other constantly, uh, and they act as a sort of support group for each other when they're dealing with various kinds of problems. 
Um, I think the biggest success, again, was the collaborative um, aspect of this thing, working with partners in each of these countries, uh, both to develop the, um, the, the content of the institute, but also to identify um, the leaders. Because of course, when they go back, the local partners are the ones that work with these uh, folks, these emerging leaders, to both encourage and support them, uh, offer advice. Uh, and so I think that was another um, real Great. successful part of it. So Thank thanks. you very Thank much, you. Chris. Uh, okay. Hi, I'm, I'm Charles Sennett, and uh, I worked for about 15 or 16 years across the street at the Boston Globe, but most of that time was, was out in the world as an uh, international correspondent. Um, and I want to I dive into a subject where I hope I can add... Um, just, just try to move the ball down the field a little bit by being very precise. But before I do that, I wanted to start with a few thank yous. I, I wanted to thank Ira Jackson for this conference because having this ability to convene these people who care about thinking through conflict resolution is, is enormously important. I really want to thank UMass Boston. Um, I also really want to thank Porig O'Malley because I've had a 30-year career, 30-plus, more than I want to admit, in journalism, and it began really when I was 17 years old. And it began really in the corner of a bar that I could sneak into, because the drinking age was 18 then, uh, called the Plow and Stars, where Porig has long been an institution and a, uh, <laughs> a owner, and convening important dialogues right there that had a lot to do with uh, my life and being suddenly made aware of the issues of Northern Ireland in particular at that time. When I was 17, this would have been in the late 70s, Belfast was, was a very intense place then. I am from a Boston Irish Catholic tribe, like there are so many here. And for the first time in my life, I began to hear stories about conflict and, and stories about those who were working in the corners then, very quiet corners of trying to find some resolution. Um, I'm gonna come back full circle to Porig in a minute, but as I was 17 working at a little tiny radio station, we didn't get paid, no, it was an internship, but we got free lunch at the plow, and that's how I first went there. So it really was my first job in journalism, first connection with Porig, and over the next 30 years, I became someone who covered Belfast. I, I went to Medellin, Colombia. I covered a lot of the sort of narco-terrorism there. I was then in the Middle East um, and, and covered the first Gulf War. I was a New York City reporter when the first World Trade Center bombing happened in 1993. That led me to really exploring what we now know as nascent Al-Qaeda. That led me to coming to the Boston Globe eventually, where the Globe made me the Middle East Bureau Chief in 1997. And I went there with my first son, who was about three weeks old when we moved uh, as a family to Jerusalem, where I set up the Middle East Bureau for the Globe. <coughs> Kept covering this idea of nascent Al-Qaeda, the Africa bombings in 1998, 2000, the coal bombing. It was uh, really in the middle of the intensity of all that, that the actual peace process in Israel-Palestine began to try to take shape, if you remember. This is a time, if you go back to 1999, when you could really feel the possibilities for peace at that moment. And when I arrived, we were arriving at a time of bus bombings, a real time of tumult, a time just after Rabin's assassination but also a time when there was more progress toward what we thought would be a fulfillment of the peace negotiations. Final status talks were underway. And I thought to myself that um, maybe I could find an angle to try to get Americans to care about this place, to rethink it, to reconsider how they look at Israel-Palestine because there was so much sort of uh, torn cartilage and scar tissue and an inability to look at these issues clearly, I found, as an American journalist in Jerusalem. And what I realized was um, 
there's a quiet angle there that I hoped would reveal a new way of looking at it. And that was to really get inside the Christian minority, the Arab Christian minority inside Israel-Palestine. So here you had a situation that I thought this was a, at first a very elegiac story, a very sad story about the disappearance of Christians from the land where the faith began. And if the peace process took hold, I wondered if it wouldn't be possible that many European and American Christians who may have been fearful of coming to the Holy Land before might now come. So could we find a book that could take you on a modern journey through the Middle East? In this year, 1999, cusp of 2000, could there be peace? It's the millennium. Maybe I'll actually go out looking at what we measured as 2,000 years, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem. How could we take a journey on the path of Jesus' life as a way to reconsider the modern Middle East? I'm not particularly religious, got a little bit beat up by nuns. I'm, I'm, um, I'm someone who's reported very aggra aggressively on, on my own church, on the Catholic Church. I, I broke what is widely considered the first priest sex abuse story in the United States of America. I worked on the Globe's uh, very powerful and important series on uh, the priest sex abuse scandal. I say that because I came at it from the point of view of history. What can the Christians of the Holy Land teach us about the moment we were in? And I thought it was a mischievous way to do that. Now, we had this wonderful framing by Nava of these issues. Who is more humane? Who's a minority? It's a really big question because, of course, the Israelis uh, could argue they are a minority within the much larger Arab Middle East. And then Israeli Arabs can argue they're a minority within Israel. And then you have, uh, you know, sort of everyone defining themselves as a minority or a majority as it suits them. How do you view the other? Who is the other in relationship to you? What I found was the conflict between the Israelis and Palestinians had been short-circuited into Muslims and Jews. And by, by really drawing attention to the Christian Arab presence, you were able to take that and draw it down a little bit more precisely to look at how are Muslims treating Christians, how are Israelis treating Christians? What is it like to be uh, an Israeli uh, Palestinian or Israeli Arab who is Christian? What's it like to live in Nazareth, which is within Israel, so there you have the Israeli Arabs, that's the Christian presence there. What's it like to live in the West Bank in Bethlehem and to be uh, a Palestinian Christian living now surrounded by an increasingly um, uh, extremist group of Palestinian activists, particularly as the Intifada takes hold. How did the Christians feel? It was, a, I think, I hope, uh, a wonderfully complex equation that I tried to draw out in a book called The Body and the Blood, The Christians of the Holy Land and the Possibilities for Peace. I think the Christian Arabs offered us a couple of things. For one thing, they offered us a sense of how they played a unique role in short-circuiting religious extremism. It's very hard for, the, for, for a Christian Arab who is Palestinian to talk to an Islamic fundamentalist about nationalism and Arab nationalism and identity when they feel excluded by that. It's a very interesting way to get to sort of tease out how no one here has that, that wonderful phrase that Nava brought to us about the, the, the debate over who's more, more humane. How are you treating this tiny little minority? But most of all for the West, to try to view Christendom tends to think of itself as so powerful and in the majority. What if you're a tiny, small minority? inside a much larger conflict. What does that look like when you're a Christian and you're walking on the streets of the Via Dolorosa in Jerusalem, you're looking at the community? I know I have about a minute and I will stick to that. Um, it's very hard to spell these complex ideas out in this short time. I hope we can do a little bit more in the Q&A, but, but the other role the Christians play, I think, is a unique role in trying to be brokers for peace and reconciliation. They had a, a unique impetus toward that. Many of the people who defined 
how we view the Palestinian cause are themselves Christian, like Edward Said is a Palestinian Christian, Hanan Ashrawi is a Palestinian Christian. They became interlocutors with the West, and it's important that we know that role, we know that history, and we study it. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end with, um, with that there, other than to say that this story was also, for me, a very personal story about my family. As I told you, I arrived with one son, and there we had two more sons born. Uh, one son was born in Jerusalem, and so he has uh, a wonderful Israeli birth certificate. American citizen, but Israeli birth certificate. His mother is Jewish. So on his birth certificate, issued by the Israeli government, it says, nationality, religion is the same thing, basically, on how you define it on a birth certificate, which is interesting in itself. But it says, religion, Jewish, because of course, the religion of the mother defines the religion of the child. Then it says, place of birth, city, Jerusalem, Israel. Then you look at his US passport and it says, place of birth, Jerusalem, nation of birth, blank. Because of course it's a final status issue for peace talks. That's why the US embassy is in Tel Aviv, not Jerusalem. Our next son down the line is born in Bethlehem in the West Bank. His birth certificate is issued by the Palestinian Authority. There it says religion, which is of course determined by the faith of the father, Christian. Then his US passport, his US national passport says, city of birth, Bethlehem, country of birth, blank, because it's not yet a state as defined by the United States government. Therefore, we have two sons who I think wonderfully defy all of these divisions that, that, that exist. They define the religious laws and the state laws and they're born in two holy cities, Jerusalem and Bethlehem, who in that moment of their birth sort of wonderfully defy the notions of nationality and to some extent religion. And I think in their births, um, we see something a little bit interesting and maybe mischievous and maybe even a tiny bit mystical, which is those are holy cities ultimately. And there's great potential within the faiths, the three Abrahamic faiths, to find ways to contravene all the dividing lines and to really look for the messages within the Abrahamic faiths that draw on the lessons of peace and reconciliation. Nowhere in my 30 years of reporting have I seen more effective work in that direction than on a recent trip I took to Kaduna uh, with Darren Q and with the program that is headed up here, where Darren was with Porig, and this was a real full circle moment for me, right? From 17 years old, then I cover all those conflicts, and then I'm with Porig O'Malley, who has convened peacemakers and people who take chances from all those conflicts I covered. It was a really big moment. But the biggest moment of all was getting to see the work that the Interfaith Mediation Center is doing in the field to have a chance to meet the pastor and the imam, to see Imam Ashafa and to see Pastor James working so hard on the ground. I think it was, in all those years of reporting, um, my favorite moment in the field. Thank you. Park, please. And thank you. I should tell you that uh, Charlie was 17 and uh, what he remembers is that he was underage and we served him. <laughs> uh, uh, and since then he's gone on to be uh, a lot of places he served a lot of, uh, a lot of alcohol, plus <laughs> other things. Um, when I told a friend uh, about this panel, he said, did you hear about what Pope Innocent III said? I said, no. And he said, well, this is about 11, 12, 79. And uh, it was during the Crusades, which are very pertinent in the Middle East. And um, the army were going to attack the, um, the, uh, the Muslims uh, had taken over a city, um, but 
the commander of the army knew that there were a number of non-believers uh, in the city and he didn't know how he could determine who was a non-believer and who was a believer. So he sent a message back to Pope Innocent III saying what his dilemma was and the Pope's reply was, kill them all, God will know his own. And uh, it's a kind of profound remark if you think about it. Um, I'm going to try to cover two things. Um, I probably won't get to the second, but if I do, I do. And the first thing is to talk about the um, Palestinian-Israeli um, peace, um, quote unquote, uh, process, which is an utter phony and has no chance ever of going anywhere as it is uh, structured at the present time because it's built on so many series of illusions and assumptions that you could fill this whole room and there would still be space to make more. Um, first of all, let's think about time. Let's just take 2030 as a, as a base. That's only 20, less than 20 years from now. Right now, the number of Israeli Jews and non-Israeli Jews in mandatory Palestine is about 50-50. And the balance, because of the birth rate uh, among the non-Jewish population and among the Israeli-Palestinian population, both mean that from here on and forever, the Jewish population of mandatory Palestine is going to drop. Not only is it going to drop in mandatory Palestine, it's also going to drop within Israel itself because the Israeli-Palestinian rate of birth is higher than the uh, Jewish-Israeli rate of birth. So, at one level, all this talk about a Jewish state is you're talking about a state that is increasingly going to have a fewer number of Jews. And if you take a projection to the year 2050, you're talking about the proportion of Jews in Israel um, that will be around 70%. Very difficult to call a country that is a 70% of one nationality and 30% of another nationality a single state. It's a binational state and the Israeli-Palestinians have the right to collective rights. Um, now within Israel itself, you have the Haredim. The Haredim account for 10% of the population today. Um, in 2030, they will account for 30% sorry, 20% of the population, they've doubled their proportion in the population because they have a, a terrific rate of birth. They produce about five children per woman. And um, the Haredim um, don't really accept the state of Israel. Uh, uh, their real function is to produce children to keep the demographic balance somewhat, somewhat the same. Um, but more importantly, one of every three school children in, in Israel is going to a school run by the Haredim. And the Haredim don't believe in math, and they don't believe in science, and they don't believe in technology. So Israel is beginning to produce a generation of young people who are leaving school without the tools to handle the modern world. Why do I say this um, peace process is phony? Um, the first thing about a peace process to me is that you must have all the players who are relevant at the table. Um, who do we have at the table? Um, we have the uh, PLO represented by President Abbas, whose legitimacy existed in uh, 2010. We have um, the Israeli government, uh, we have the PLO, whose legitimacy is also run out. Um, we have no representative from the Arab-Israeli community. 
you have no representative from the settler community. Now, the settler community is about a population of a half a million people between Jerusalem and the West Bank. Um, and under no matter what quote unquote two state solution might be reached, and the best estimate of the number of settlers that have, will have to be evacuated is someplace between 70 and 100,000. And the best estimate of those who are messianic or who would resist because they are fulfilling God's will by being on this land is between seven and 10,000 people. And the question is, who is going to take this army out, these people out? Now also, a disproportionate number of the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, are settlers. And an even higher proportion of the senior officers in the IDF are settlers. So any Israeli Prime Minister having to make a decision right now, if he's going to order, order his army to go in and take out seven to 10,000 militant messianic Jews, he has to wonder, can he depend upon that army to do so? Will it in fact obey the orders? And my reference point to that is 900, 1912, when the British army mutinied in the Curra in Ireland, when they were told to go north and disband uh, the Protestant Unionist community that were importing arms, and they refused to do so, and the British government backed down. So a prime minister would be very, very hesitant. Who can he trust? Now, more importantly, let us say that some through miracle, you actually uh, put this uh, two state together and that it had um, East Jerusalem as its capital, it had the 1967 borders, it even uh, arrived at some arrangement over uh, the, the, the refugees. Uh, who's left out? Hamas is left out. Hamas, the militant organization that controls Gaza and who is sole aim is the destruction of Israel and uh, that has a, um, a more than adequate uh, rocket capacity that will increase in time to hit uh, probably any Israeli city. But the more important thing is, if you were clever and you were a member of Hamas who are imprisoned in, in, in Gaza at the moment, well, you would say, let us buy into any two-state solution because that means the Israelis have to build a corridor between Gaza and the West Bank. And that means we get into the West Bank. And the topography of the West Bank is ideal for firing rockets. And every city in Israel would be within the firing range of their rockets as their rockets exist now, not in five years, not in 10 years. And finally, if there, if there is a finally, um, there was, yeah. So they have every incentive to agree to a two-state solution which they have no intention of keeping. And this, by the way, is exactly what every poll has consistently showed over the last 10 years, that a majority of uh, Israeli Jews believe in a two-state solution, but a majority, nearly two-thirds, believe that the um, Palestinians would use a two-state solution to achieve what the real agenda is, and that is to reclaim all of Palestine. Now, given all these variables, and the fact that, that I mean, I asked Dr. Sabe, Eric Hatt, about why is there religion on the agenda? And he said, oh, who can talk about God? That was the end of that discussion. Religion is a huge issue on the Jewish side, Messianic. In Gaza, you have uh, an Islamist community 
Oh, the land is waff land, is belongs, the sovereignty of the land belongs to God. And let's even say that you had this Palestinian state. You have a situation of the West Bank, which are largely secular Muslims, and you have Gaza, which is, uh, for the most part, Islamic. But what kind of, what kind of a uh, constitution would they produce? One that would follow Sharia law, one that would have pluralistic norms and values, another situation set up for conflict. So the only way that Israel would ever agree to a two-state solution, taking into account the capacity of Hamas, is that it would demand, as part of that peace agreement, as was demanded of the IRA in, in Ireland, that they must decommission all their arms, that Islamic Jihad and every other Jihadist group must de decommission, destroy their arms, and destroy their inventory of arms, and there isn't the slightest chance in God's earth of that ever, ever happening. He says, I've two, two minutes still left. Uh, well, For your solution. So, uh, <laughs> so, that's one minute ago. Um, so the table is wrong. And on, on, until, and, and on, the, on the Palestinian side, the people who are negotiating today are the same people who were negotiating in Madrid in 1991. They're all the same guys. Now, they've been talking for 1991 to 2015 or whatever. And, and you know what? They meet thousands of hours in between, hundreds of thousands of hours, and they've talked about settlements, they've talked about borders, they've talked about security, they've talked about the right of return, and guess what? After all those hours, they're exactly where they were. And what had these guys to give any longer? The first best thing that could be done on the Palestinian side would be saying, A, all you old guys who are our negotiators, step down, your time is up. The greatest threat within the West Bank is the Fatah party, the party of Abu, uh, Abu Mazen or, or Mahmoud Abbas. The number of successors who are lined up to succeed him would stretch the length of this floor. And all of them have their own militias. And he's 79. And when he goes, God knows what's going to happen in Fatah. So to me, there are no optimistic signs at all of there being a two-state solution, more particularly when you take into account what the future demographics are going to be. For example, in northern Israel, whole swaths of northern Israel um, would be Palestinian. Um, about 90% of the uh, population of Israel lives within a 50 mile radius of Tel Aviv. So you could have northern Israel and the Arab Israelis there looking for autonomy. They are already making a bid for collective rights. You have the state of Israel itself trying to balance the Haredim who don't work because they're studying the Torah and therefore they have to be supported by the rest of the population. Um, the rest of the population is saying, why the hell are we paying our taxes to support people who aren't working? There's a problem of bringing, bringing the, uh, the Haredim into the working population. And these are just a few of the problems. In the scheme of things in the Middle East today, looking at Syria, just as one comparative yardstick, the Arab-Israeli-Palestinian-Israeli conflict is a small thing, not a big thing. And John Kerry is getting the message. 
there are bigger threats to American national security in many other places in the world. Those threats don't exist in Palestine and Israel. Thank you. Now I'll talk it's about a tough what I'm going to talk about. A tough day to end a conference like this, or at least the first day of it, on a down note. Uh, questions for our panelists? Please. Behind you, there's a microphone. Hello, Nancy Shippen with the Alternatives to Violence Project. I'm wondering, from this panel and actually from the Nigerian group, if anybody's considered the empowerment of women and getting their voices at the table and their potential impact on this process. Okay. Anyone up here want to start with women at I the table? I nominate Nava. You, you nominate <laughs> Nava. Jar Charlie, that was very dexterous <laughs> of you. Talk about nimble. Okay. Nava, do you want to uh, speak to the question? So, uh, women, I think they have a big role in, uh, in uh, what we see in groups that uh, in many times they align with men in the, the way how they are dealing with the conflict. But we could see in the peace movement in Israel, there were several uh, uh, peace important groups like Four Mothers and the Coalition of uh, Women for Peace. And so in the peace movement, you will see the role more important. Part of it, I think, is related to the fact that they are less combating. Today, they are also combat uh, women who are doing combat in, in the army, but, but they are less doing this job. And uh, uh, so they, I think they should play a bigger role. Uh, Unfortunately, in the media in Israel, all the uh, people who are analyzing the situation usually are uh, men, uh, Jewish men who served uh, in the army. And uh, I think uh, uh, we chose to, to encourage uh, women journalists to take uh, more more prominent role in advancing uh, uh, media that is uh, uh, sensitive to the conflict and bringing the narrative of the other. But there is a lot still to do in that sense. Let me just build on that. Do you see any difference between men and women in the workshops, in the way they respond to the dynamics of the workshop? When the, the, the process in those groups has several stages. When it's the heat of the conflict, usually, as I said, women align with men uh, uh, struggling and fighting over issues. But on later stages, when it, it is related to more reflective uh, modes and analyzing modes, they take more a leading role. Interesting. Okay, thank you. What, uh, question. I yes. one question. Oh, I'm sorry. That, uh, to right. say, one of the things that we learned in our institute, I think, is that uh, both in terms of the women who were key to the facilitating the um, dialogue that we had going during the month, and the participants themselves, because we were very insistent that we had both lay and clerical, male and female. Um, and uh, it was very clear to me by the end of that month that if women were in charge, all of us would be out of business, probably. Okay. Parv, did you want to? Well, um, I'll add two comments. Uh, one is that uh, if women uh, were the heads of all states in the world, this would be a far more peaceful world. Women are infinitely superior to men in just about everything. And if you want to see that, just go to Africa. The women work, the men sit and do nothing. Go to Shippin and drink beer. 
But I want to go back to, I did hear I'm deaf, but I did hear the word peace now, I think you mentioned, which is the organization in Israel that uh, thrived in the, um, in, in the 70s, led mostly by women um, who take great risks um, and publish incredible material on violations of human rights in the, uh, in the West Bank um, and by the Israeli government. But um, it's dead. Israel has not just moved to the right and further to the right, but every statistic indicates it's going to move further to the right still. In the cohort of young people of 18 to 25 who have been part of a longitudinal study that's now in its third year showed that Israeli youth are becoming harder, more right-wing, more racist, not only against Palestinians, more racist against Israeli Palestinians. If they had their way, they would have them all transferred out of Israel and into the West Bank, which is why Israeli Palestinians keep a very low profile in any peace process because some of the hardliners in a negotiating process is say, do you know what? We'll shift all those Israeli Palestinians, which would be against international law, but who cares about international law? No one ever obeys it. We'll shift them into the new Palestinian state, and that will give us more breathing room. Thank you very much. I just want uh, uh, Professor O'Malley, Chris, and any of you, from your own practical experience in practical engagement, either in research or in engaging in number of bridge building across the world, what really is the motivating factor for the political actors and members of the diplomatic community failing to bring religion or religious actors into the framework for searching for sustainable peace in those conflict-prone communities, which sustaining factor or motivating factor have been clearly seen as religion. Why? Why are the political actors? When they talk of track two diplomacy, in some event, in the success of track two diplomacy, religious actor have been used. Cam David Accord couldn't have been broken if religious passion was not motivated into Anwaru Sadat and Rabin. The same applies in Zimbabwe, the rule of St. Egidio. The same applies what Reverend Jesse Jackson has done. The same applies even during the colonial past, what Gandhi or Martin Luther King has done. This role these religious actors have played, including, of course, Desmond Tutu. And we know that motivating factor for Nelson Mandela religion also play a role in it. Why is it so difficult with all these evidences that our political actors are making it, find it difficult to bring religion actors into play in searching for sustainable peace? Okay. Of course, it's Middle East and so on and so forth. Um, I'll have a question for you too, um, uh, Iman. Um, Israel, the Palestinian Nelson Mandela is in jail. His name is uh, Marvin Barghouti, um, who took the responsibility for a lot of the uh, murders in, during the Second Intifada, and he's serving a life sentence. And um, he, like Mandela, spends a lot of his time. I know some of the people who visit him, uh, former generals in the, ID, in the Israeli security forces, who've long conversations with him. And this man has spent his time learning, as Mandela did, Israeli culture. He spent his time learning Hebrew, because one of the things that Mandela emphasized that to, em that to communicate and understand the people, you must speak their language. And if he were to run the president today, 
every opinion poll shows that if, it, if there were a, a presidential poll, he would win it. And he is the prisoner that needs to be released. But he has the charismatic power to change, like Mandela, like Tudu, like Gandhi. And you will find Palestinians saying over and over again, if we only had another Rabin, there are no leaders. The crop of leaders across the political landscape in, in Israel and Palestine is just mediocre. But the question asked, do you want to take the question I, that I the to, Iman was re responding I to? to? Very respectfully, I am poor at student, and as I say, I have been. Use the mic, yeah. I want to say very respectfully that I am poor Gomali student, and as I shared with you, I have been for a really long time. But I'm going to try to capture the rhythm of a phrase that was used in American politics very famously. Porig, I knew Marwan Barghouti. <laughs> and Marwan Barghouti is no Nelson Mandela. Um, he is a very important activist on the street, but his intention toward, toward violence was pretty obvious. It, there was no enlightened leadership from him on the street about a different path, a different path for using nonviolence as a strategy. I wish we saw that, but we never did. I, I love the hopefulness of thinking that because he's been in prison all these years uh, and has, has somehow had time to reflect and to maybe get to know Israeli culture better, to get to know the language of Hebrew, to think that is very hopeful, and I hope you're right, um, but I think to, to your question, Iman, the, I covered every inch of the peace process when it failed the last time. On every one of those meetings at Camp David and then the Y Agreement and then we had Sharm El Sheikh and we went all over the place to all these very nice hotels where we got to go to these wonderful peace conferences where nothing was really happening. And I do think a tremendous failure on the part of, of the interlocutors, the US, Israel, and Palestine, was to fail to include the religious leadership. It's, it, it is an impossibility that the equation can be successfully solved without them. So where are they is a fair question. You have some people like um, Rabbi Melcher, who's really important in the mainstream. Um, uh, the, 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 the Christian leadership has been okay, not hugely great, no great, I don't see anything great there. And I definitely, sadly, have seen nothing in the side of uh, the Islamic leadership, religious leadership. There has been s just no voice there. And I want to encourage you to go. You, seriously, you and uh, Pastor James, and to try to teach, as Porig has, has done so wonderfully and mischievously around the world to get people working together, they need someone who learns to draw on the lessons of their faith, not for conflict, but for peace. And particularly, if I, if I may say so, on, on the Islamic side. I just other add, I, Hang on, Park. I'm really, there are other questions, sure. and we're running down on time at the end of a long day. Please, in the back, I see a hand. Is that Maha? Hello. Thank you very much for your input. Um, I just want to ask um, a little bit about Wahid Salam and um, about th this re-entry stage when the participants in the program go back to their community and go back to living their everyday life. Um, how much of the um, permanent situation on the ground, wherever they live in their communities, affects them and, and the results of the program. And um, I want to ask all of you, how much do you think that, um, because, because this has been a very, a, a dilemma for me, um, do we really call it a religious conflict or do we call it a very highly political interest-based conflict that has dragged religion into it? And mm -hmm. if we focus more and more on religion, then we're, yeah. we're actually telling people you are different because of your religion. I have, um, 
I know that there are Palestinian Jews. There is a Jewish sect that are Palestinian. I know that there are Palestinian Christians. There are Palestinian yeah. um, Muslims. I want to jump on your, on your comment because I think the question is, you know, is it a religious conflict? And the answer, I would, I would say, is no. And you're, you're right on the money. I, I want to say this very quickly. It's about land. It's about justice. It's about rights. It's about history. It's about many things. But religion has become part of the wiring of the conflict. And in order to diffuse the conflict, in order to literally take it apart the way you would take apart an explosive device, you need the people who know the wiring, who actually know how to speak to their religious communities to say that the messages of violence that you're drawing on from your faith are wrong. The messages to the Jewish settlers needs to be deconstructed by a very convincing rabbi. The message to Hamas needs to be deconstructed by a very convincing imam. They need the leadership in their own faith but to undo the wiring. That does that, I'm, just a quick note, does that empower some of the le religious leaders to a point where they, um, where when a generation of what we consider good religious leaders and peaceful ones who um, promote this peace process, they're at some point gone, would someone else take the legacy? Do we empower those people so much that the communities keep their dependence on them for any futuristic peace process or integrative talks. And can, I, can I also come back to your first question, which you directed uh, yes. at Nava, and ask Nava if she would respond to that piece of the question? Yes. When we put our goals to create awareness, to take responsibility, the next goal was the activism. It's not enough that you change yourself inside and now you respect the narrative of the other, you get the perception that it's a, uh, this piece of land belongs to both sides, not only to one side. Uh, people need to, to take actions to change reality. Uh, we developed courses which we call change agents courses in which people, uh, ca uh, we work with people people who come from professions that have an impact on, on reality, like journalists, like environmentalists, like young politicians, uh, and they, and we do them across the border with Palestinian peace NGOs uh, from Palestine, and they become very active to change the situation. There is an organization that is called Rabbis for Human Rights. It, it's a small organization, but the head of the organization is a graduate of the School for Peace mm, really? years ago, uh, Arik Asherman. Uh, there is another uh, lawyer working in this uh, uh, Palestinian lawyer who is a graduate of our uh, program and he is working in this organization. So. The voices of uh, uh, religious, I think uh, <laughs> politicians are using the religion in order to pursue their goals, in order to keep on the occupation, in order to uh, keep the status quo, in order to demand uh, that uh, Abu Mazen will uh, recognize the Jewish state, not Israel, Jewish state. Uh, Hamas is also using those, uh, the religion in order to pursue their, their goals. So the, the religion in many cases is used in order to continue this ongoing go going conflict. And unfortunately, the voices of religious leaders, the right-wing religious leaders are much louder uh, we saw cases where rabbis were inciting against uh, the rabbi of uh, the town uh, Tzfat in the Galilee, incited uh, against uh, calling people not to rent apartments to Arabs, where many Arabs live in the north of the country. The whole issue of assassination of rabbin was after a lot of incitement against against his work towards uh, peace. So 
those voices are much stronger than voices like of Yeshayahu Leibovich or Malki Or or Rabbi Furman or other people that, that uh, try to speak another voice. And then those voices need to be empowered and uh, invested in. Alas, we have captured here the optimism and the pessimism of that conflict uh, in full. Uh, it is the end of our panel's time. Darren would like to come up and do a wrap up for us for the day. I think we owe the panel an enormous debt of gratitude and we should express it now. For those who want to know more about Neve Shalom, there are some materials back on the table uh, in that corner um, you can pick up and learn more about. Darren, you want to come up? Thank you very much, panelists. We're, we are adjourned as a panel.